Good morning. Hello. Welcome to the German Marshall Fund Book Talk. I'm Karen Kornblue. I'm director of GMF Digital, and we are delighted to host Daryl West today. Daryl, as you all know, is a leading voice, uh, not only on technology policy, but also, of course, vice president and director of governance studies at the Brookings Institution, where he holds the Douglas Dillon Chair. He's also co-editor-in-chief there of Tech Tank, which is both a blog and a new podcast. Prior to Brookings, uh, Daryl was the John Hazen White Professor of Political Science and Public Policy and Director of the Taubman Center for Public Policy at Brown University. Um, we're delighted to have him on today. Uh, Daryl, it's so great to be having this discussion. We seem to be perpetually caught in the day's news cycle lately. Uh, each day there seem to be several news cycles and we're never lifting our heads up to really plan for the future. Uh, even in the recent presidential debate, we weren't talking about the kinds of challenges that you address in your book. And as you say, we don't have a choice. The world isn't waiting, technology isn't waiting. So um, we're so happy to have you here to talk about the book that you and John Allen have written. Uh, it's very readable. It's um, really focuses the mind on AI and the challenges before us. So I'd like to just open it up, have you talk for 10 minutes, tell us about the book, tell us about the, the fork in the road that we're at right now. Then I'll ask some questions and then uh, audience members, um, if you could see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q and A button and there you can submit your questions. I'll sort through them and I'll moderate a discussion with Daryl for the second half of this recording. So welcome everybody and Daryl, um, we're eager to hear from you. Well, thank you, Karen. Uh, we appreciate you hosting this event. It's great to see all the interest in AI. So uh, John Allen and I wrote this book because we think AI is the transformative technology of our time. It's being deployed in sectors from healthcare and education to transportation, e-commerce, and national defense. What we do in the book is present in-depth case studies of AI in each of those areas, uh, looking at both the opportunities as well as the risks. And we did try and write the book for a general audience just to explain the technical issues to uh, journalists, policymakers, and the uh, general uh, public. We also take a deep dive into AI and national defense. Uh, John Allen is a retired general, so uh, he has thought a lot about AI and uh, defense, AI and military applications. Uh, we look at the geopolitical aspects in terms of the relations uh, between the United States, uh, China, Russia, and Europe. So uh, some of your uh, European uh, listeners uh, would be interested in that uh, angle. We chose the title of Turning Point for the book because we argue that we are at a major inflection point that could lead either to utopia or dystopia. And the crucial variable in determining which of those ways we go is really public policy. So we present a detailed policy a blueprint. Uh, we suggest that if we take appropriate actions, we're very confident about the future of technology and the future for society. But if we don't do certain things, uh, things would go off the rails uh, pretty uh, quickly. And it's interesting, uh, a while ago, there was a Price Waterhouse Cooper study that predicted that AI is going to increase global GDP by over $15 trillion by 2030. But the interesting thing was the regional uh, background because that study uh, uh, argued that $7 trillion was going to accrue to China, $3.7 trillion would go to the United States and Canada, and only $1.8 trillion was going to go to Europe. So the stakes are high, the economic stakes and the uh, security uh, stakes are very high. And I've given a number of talks about uh, AI in the United States and around the world. And the one thing that people fear about AI is just the loss of human control. People worry that the technology is just accelerating rapidly and COVID certainly has accelerated a number of uh, tech changes, online learning, telemedicine, e-commerce and remote work. People worry that we're just gonna lose control uh, and eventually we're gonna end up in a uh, completely dystopian uh, situation. And I think we're at an interesting point right now because for the last 30 years, 
America has been very libertarian in its stance to AI, as well as technology in general. Uh, we have pretty much delegated most of the major decisions to private tech companies. Uh, they decide what innovations to produce, what products and services to roll out, uh, to whom to sell them, uh, when they uh, deploy them, and so on. Uh, there's been very little government of regulation in many different aspects of technology. I think we're at a turning point where that regime is going to change. I think there is a tech lash that is emerging. You can see it in terms of public opinion surveys, uh, people's worries about privacy, cybersecurity, uh, competition policy, and other areas. Uh, you can start to see more regulation coming at the state and local level in the United States. Uh, there are several localities that already have banned facial recognition uh, for use by uh, U.S. Uh, law enforcement. Uh, some communities are placing restrictions on Airbnb rentals because they worry about the impact on uh, local residents. Uh, California has passed a privacy law. They've uh, imposed new restrictions in terms of the gig economy. So there's a lot of stuff that's starting to percolate at the state and local level. We still have not seen a lot of impetus towards regulation at the national level in the United States. But yet in Congress, there are a lot of bills that are now being proposed and actually introduced. Uh, the House Antitrust Subcommittee has been holding a series of hearings uh, and, and collecting evidence that they suggest uh, that uh, the United States has a big problem uh, with the large uh, tech platforms, that we're losing competition, there are harms to small and medium size of businesses. Uh, they are about, uh, that committee is about to produce a report that's going to have some far-reaching uh, proposals uh, for the uh, tech sector. So I think we are at this inflection point where people are seeing enough problems, they're wanting a more active uh, government role. So the book kind of lays out uh, what some of the options are, and then we make our own recommendations in terms of what we think makes sense uh, going forward. That's a great overview. Uh, thanks so much. Um, you You start the book... Uh, by talking about a survey that you did with experts and they gave you sort of their dreams and their nightmares about AI. And I wanted to know what, what your dream is like, if like, let, uh, because we're, as you say, the tech lash has taken hold and I think people are um, concerned about what they're seeing and feeling, uh, especially with regard to social media these days. And so there's a sense of, let's just turn it all off, you know, um, so what is your view about, you know, why this is a good thing? Why we, why it's worth it? Um, is it, is it healthcare? Where do you see the biggest um, room for improvement? I mean, I think there are a lot of opportunities through AI and other emerging uh, technologies. I mean, technology can start to take over the repetitive, boring, or dangerous tasks. It can improve human efficiency and effectiveness. I think in the short run, Technology is going to, to augment human performance as opposed to replace humans, uh, which is what uh, people fear. Uh, it's a way to reduce costs while providing high quality services. In terms of particular applications uh, in healthcare, uh, there are lots of promising things like even uh, now uh, with uh, COVID and scientists uh, racing to come up with drug therapies and vaccines, AI is providing a lot of help to them uh, in the sense that there's now AI that can scan the scientific literature and start to identify promising chemical compounds for COVID as well as other types of diseases and thereby save the scientists from that task of actually physically reviewing the literature of themselves. So uh, that's one way that AI is uh, very helpful. But yet at the same time, you know, people worry about the loss of fairness, uh, problems of bias, uh, lack of transparency, impact on human safety. Uh, in other countries, the move towards mass surveillance and using technology to repress uh, human rights. So there are a lot of concerns on the table and we need to take those concerns seriously. There are lots of public opinion surveys that indicate people are worried about several different aspects. So we need to figure out how to retain the benefits of technology innovation while also addressing the very reasonable concerns that people have about many different aspects of technology. Yes, I wanted to ask you about that too. Um, I, I was telling you one of my favorite lines in the book is, Corporate coders increasingly are digital sovereigns who set the rules of the road in terms of service for consumers. And that, that is quite a sentence um, and it really rings true. 
Um, but you also note, as you just did, that there's, there's need for some rules of the road, some guardrails, especially with regard to discrimination and bias. And so you lay out this policy blueprint, um, but it seems lighter on government, national government policy than some other experts have, have um, put out, including uh, your colleague, Bill Galston. Um, so discuss, discuss the blueprint. And one of the things you mentioned is a duty of care. You talk about ethical guidelines. And I'm just wondering how do you, if there's a lighter role for national government, and the way I see you talking about that is you're, you're skeptical of government's capacity and, and flexibility and agility. Um, but without a role for government, or, or how, what do you see the role of government in enforcing uh, some of these ethical guidelines and duty of care when, when the ethical guidelines come in contact with the business model? Uh, that's a great question. And I think you're certainly right. When we look at the past, governments have been almost completely inept when it has come to regulating the technology sector. I mean, we remember some of the past congressional hearings where legislators asked questions that were just completely embarrassing because they revealed an ignorance on their part about the tech sector and how technology operates and how uh, the major uh, companies operate. So what we do is uh, argue that we need to beef up the regulatory capacity, we need to beef up the enforcement of process. We have recommendations for what companies should be doing and then what the government should be doing. And your question uh, mentioned this idea of digital sovereigns. Like Facebook actually is a digital sovereign in the sense that uh, this Facebook nation uh, has more than 2 billion citizens, uh, people who are availing themselves of the platform and Facebook is setting the rules of the road there. Uh, we argue that uh, companies need to take the ethical aspects of AI much more seriously than they have at this point. What a lot of companies do is basically develop new products, put them out in the marketplace. Uh, one or two years later, problems start to develop. And then we say, oh my God, there are all these problems. And then they try and uh, figure out how to mitigate uh, those uh, problems. We argue that's way too late. We have to become much more proactive. Companies need to start hiring ethicists. Uh, some companies have started to develop uh, AI ethics codes to guide their product development. Uh, some have developed AI review boards uh, so that they can anticipate what the possible problems are of their products while they still are in the design stage and then uh, try and figure out how to address those problems before uh, the AI gets uh, widely deployed. So I think there are a lot of things companies can do, but we can't just count on the companies. Like government needs to step up as well. We have a bunch of different uh, recommendations. Uh, I'll just mention a, a few. Uh, one is uh, we need to start developing AI impact statements. Uh, this idea is kind of modeled after the environmental impact statements of 50 years ago. Uh, back then, uh, as companies were starting to engage in various economic development uh, uh, projects, we knew there were certain consequences for the environment. Uh, so we basically uh, had a requirement that companies had to explain what their economic development project was, what the possible harm was to the environment, and then work out mitigation strategies to deal with those harms. We argue that we need the same type of thing uh, in terms of AI. And this is for publicly funded large scale projects. So it's not your mom and pop uh, coding uh, projects, but you know the big projects that are really going to affect a lot of people. And that organizations need to think about uh, what the AI is, how it's being deployed, what the possible problems are, and how we can mitigate uh, those uh, issues. We just need to incorporate these types of concerns much earlier in the development process than uh, what we've done before. Bias is clearly a big problem uh, in terms of AI. Uh, there already have been some well-documented uh, racial biases and gender uh, biases, uh, facial recognition software is much more accurate for Caucasians as opposed to minorities, in part because the training data overrepresents Caucasians and underrepresents uh, minorities. Uh, sometimes uh, there has been as much as a 30 percentage point differential in the accuracy rates there. So we need to start uh, with facial recognition as well as other uh, technologies 
think about the equity angle, the fairness angle, and the bias question, there are a lot of anti-discrimination rules and anti-bias rules for the bricks and mortar world. We need to figure out how to deploy those ideas for the digital economy. There are new types of issues that are popping up, uh, new types of rules and regulations that are going to be required, uh, but you know, we need to uh, uh, take that seriously. We need to invest a lot more in digital access and broadband to make sure everybody can share in the benefits of the technology revolution. We need a national data strategy. A lot of the data now are proprietary in nature and are in the hands of the tech company. Uh, researchers don't have access to that information. So a lot of the AI is being deployed for products that are commercially viable and AI for the public good gets short shrift because they're, the companies perceive there's no money uh, in uh, those types of things. This is a role that government can play in providing funding for things that might not be commercially viable, but might be socially valuable. They might help local communities uh, figure out how to deal with traffic and environmental problems. Uh, uh, they can figure out how we can uh, do a better job on sustainability. So there are a bunch of things that we think government needs to start to do uh, and this old libertarian model we think is going to fade away and there is going to be more public oversight, public engagement and public regulation. Uh, that's great. And I, I wanna get more into those um, positive scenarios and how we spur them on. Um, but just to stick with this theme for a second because of our transatlantic audience and, and I already see questions that I'll come to in a minute when I turn to them, but uh, just to tease it, what do you see in the differences of the approach between how the US and the European Union are, are handling AI now? There are still substantial differences uh, between the two uh, regions. Uh, again, the US up to this point has been pretty hands off, although I think that will start to change. The EU has, you know, consistent with its stance on privacy, uh, data protection, and data sharing practices, has been much more pro-regulation, uh, wanting tech companies to respect basic human values and make sure the technology serves uh, good uses as opposed to uh, bad uses. On AI in particular, the EU has developed what it calls a risk-based risk-based approach uh, to uh, regulation in which the regulation is proportional to the scope and use of the AI and the possible impact on uh, human beings. So the EU has already identified several high-risk areas in terms of AI applications. Uh, transportation, healthcare, and energy are among uh, the areas that it has identified. Transportation is considered high-risk because a lot of the AI applications <clears throat> excuse me, are occurring in the area of autonomous vehicles. Like autonomous vehicles are, are all about the AI because the AI is what integrates the LIDAR information, the camera information, and the remote sensing information. And it does it instantly uh, and is adaptable you know, based on changing road conditions to make sure you stay in your lane. Uh, and, but you know, AI in the transportation area carries a lot of risk because of the potential for uh, car accidents and fatalities arising from that. So the EU is basically saying AI applications in these high risk areas deserve a fairly significant amount of government oversight and government regulation. There needs to be reporting requirements, uh, disclosure of rules and, uh, and, and guardrails to uh, protect the humans. There are other areas that they define as lower risk, and there, they don't want there to be a lot of regulation. They're going to re uh, uh, basically trust the companies more to uh, engage in uh, voluntary activities that protect uh, human beings uh, because the risk in terms of the scope and use is deemed to be uh, much less. So I think that's a pretty useful way to uh, think about uh, regulating uh, AI and I think as the United States starts to move more in the direction of uh, regulating AI, we can learn a lot from the European Union because what we don't want to see is heavy handed regulation that kind of stifles innovation in general because innovation is going to be the engine for the economy uh, and uh, there are lots of good uses that can come out of it. So this proportional risk-based approach, I think makes a lot of sense because you can distinguish 
AI that has a lot of possible harms and therefore needs to be regulated versus those that have far fewer harms and therefore uh, uh, we can be a little more hands off in those areas. Hey, your, your two by two matrix that you lay out um, seems to suggest that kind of risk-based approach. Yes, yeah, in the book, uh, we have a two by two uh, table uh, that basically uh, kind of follows the same type of approach, distinguishing four different categories of moving from high impact and high risk to low impact and uh, low risk. And with the amount of regulation varying depending on whether the AI uh, falls on those uh, particular uh, dimensions. So from our standpoint, you know, you want the regulation to be strong enough to address the problem, but not so strong that it stifles the innovation. So kind of getting that mix right, protecting innovation on the one hand, but then regulating bad uses of the technology and potential harms to humans, that's kind of the balance that we were going for. That's very interesting. It's um, very similar, but slightly different from the European approach. So. Um, I do want to get at um, the, uh, the sort of race with China. Um, and your book notes that the Trump administration has attempted to address uh, this competition with China on AI uh, through an American AI initiative, but it hasn't really entailed uh, a great deal of funding. And um, China is putting a lot of money into this and a lot of money into R&D and uh, demonstration projects and so on. And I'm wondering what you think the US should be doing to spur on uh, development of AI, um, R&D, but also applications. And you talked about some of the positive social uh, applications. So what, what, what is the role for government in there in terms of spurring AI? I mean, the US government needs to put many more resources into AI, both in terms of the AI itself, but also training the future workforce so that we have the human capital necessary to continue uh, the innovation that we have. But we also need a strategy. Like the United States does not have an AI strategy. I mean, you mentioned China's putting big resources into AI. They're thinking a lot about how they want to use it and what their goals are. They're very strategic in how they're uh, thinking about it. Oftentimes, the strategy is incorporating bad human values, so we have to be cognizant of, of that as well. But the United States does not have a strategy. Our strategy has basically been delegating all of the AI decisions to private companies. The problem with that, our companies have been really successful at developing uh, innovative and uh, successful commercial products and services, but the category of AI for the public good, AI for national defense, uh, AI that uh, would improve healthcare, like those areas are lagging. And if we had more of a strategy and if we had more government investment, we would help the United States develop AI in areas where there might not be a commercial market right now, and it might not be the most profitable area, but it could be really valuable for society. Like there are lots of AI uses in terms of energy management, uh, climate change, uh, environmental sustainability, and so on. The government can play a very positive role there. So the R&D feature we think is uh, very important. And to talk, continue on about the workforce transition, because I think a lot of the fears are about humans being replaced. Um, and, you know, we talk all the time about workforce transition and workforce training and lifelong learning. And I think, I think um, average citizens are pretty skeptical about um, the extent to which any of that has materialized or been successful. What can we do that's, that's different? What can we do to really make it a reality as, given this challenge? I mean, there certainly are going to be some job losses from AI and other emerging technologies. I mean, certainly people in entry level uh, positions uh, that are kind of routine and repetitive in nature, those are very easy to automate. Those are very easy to develop AI solutions. So people in the retail sector, like Amazon already has open retail outlets with no human clerks up there, no sales clerk, no uh, cash registers. You basically walk in through the turnstile, you have the Amazon app, it identifies you, you go shopping, you get the items you want. 
uh, the store has computer vision that then uh, uh, identifies what uh, you have picked up and it will charge you and you walk out. Like you don't have to go to a cash uh, register. So uh, in the finance area, there's a lot of uh, use of AI that is gonna have some job consequences. Uh, radiologists is an example of a higher level profession uh, where there's gonna be a risk because there's AI now that can read CAT scans and X-rays almost as accurately as human radiologists. So it's people worry more about the entry level uh, and rightfully so, but some of these higher level uh, occupations also are at a risk. Uh, but in the long run, I am kind of less worried about the job loss possibility than what I would call the job mismatch problem because AI is also going to generate jobs. Uh, certainly anything involving uh, data uh, is going to be uh, very much in demand. Uh, image tagging is a job that's going to uh, create a lot of uh, opportunities uh, because with all of the AI that can uh, read uh, images and videos, there has to be somebody to tag them so that we can train uh, the AI to do that. So there are definitely gonna be new jobs created. But the problem is people may not have the skills to take advantage of those new jobs. So as your question suggests, we need to take workforce development much more seriously than we do uh, now. In the United States, we actually spend a lot of money on workforce development, but it's not very good training. Uh, people come out of those programs, and in many cases, they don't get jobs. They're trained for jobs that no longer exist, or they're given skills that uh, aren't uh, in need uh, uh, or are not needed by the uh, companies. And so we need to figure out how to do workforce uh, training in a much better way, because the old model where we invested in education up through about age 25 and then after that people are on their own is going to become uh, quickly obsolete. Uh, we're going to have to move to a lifetime learning model where people are going to need to upgrade their job skills at age 30, 40, 50, and uh, 60. Uh, there's going to have to be a much greater emphasis on adult education. Uh, online learning platforms are uh, going to explode. Uh, I was on a, uh, a panel, uh, I think it was last year, with the CEO of one of the online learning platforms. He predicted that within 10 years, the adult education market was going to be as big as the current higher education market. Now, I don't know if he is right in terms of the magnitude of that prediction, but he is certainly right in the direction. We, we're going to need to put a lot of more emphasis on training people above the age of 25. So just figuring out how to do that efficiently and effectively is a very important task that we need to figure out. Yeah, I hope, I hope we can. Um, and then we put the resources into it. Um, so we have a bunch of questions predictably on US and Europe, and I'll just read two of them and then I'll tag something on. So Roger Hood asks, do you predict the US and European allies need to be in lockstep on AI development to defend and secure the Western Alliance? Uh, how is this best done? And Paul Hoffheinz um, asks, what's your advice for Europe? The figures you cite are devastating. And I guess I'll top those two off with a lot of people have talked about how maybe the US and Europe should work together, should pool some R&D in some projects or um, have the supply chain work together if we're both facing a challenge from China. Um, well, how do you see it? What should Europe be doing? What should the U.S. be doing? And how can we be doing these things together? Uh, it's a great uh, set of questions. Uh, and I think Europe should actually be very worried about its own future in regards to AI, because that Price Waterhouse Cooper study that I reported on <laughs> indicated that of the more than $15 trillion of GDP that's going to be generated by AI by 2030, only 1.8 roughly about 10% of the total is going to go to Europe. Like half of it's gonna to go to China, uh, about a quarter of it will go to the United States and Canada, but only 10% is going to go to Europe. The problem is Europe does not have its own indigenous technology sector of the large platforms that have done well globally, like the United States has been very successful at producing multinational companies in the technology area, developing new products and then getting some of the economic benefits uh, that uh, come out of that. 
Uh, Europe has not. Uh, Europe has a much tougher uh, environment in terms of startups, uh, like the United States. A lot of its success in the technology area derives from uh, actually two things. One, we have a strong startup economy. It's easy to get venture capital. It's easy to kind of start small and then uh, scale up. And then secondly, in the past, the United States benefited from the immigration policy. Like half of the Silicon Valley startups had an immigrant founder or co-founder. Uh, although, of course, now the United States is getting much tougher on immigration. And the United States should actually worry about how that's going to negatively uh, affect the uh, tech community. So I do think there's an argument for Europe and the United States to work together because right now there are three separate regimes in AI, China, the United States, and Europe. The United States now is basically in this arms race with China over AI. And by the way, it's not clear we're going to win that arms race because China has a lot of advantages in terms of developing AI. They don't have the same privacy concerns, the same commitment to human values that we do. They have a large population. It's easier to develop AI applications and then scale up. They are much further along the uh, model of moving towards uh, mobile payment uh, systems. Uh, and so they're just generating a tremendous amount of data, which then allows their AI to get better. And once you have good AI in one area, it's easier to develop AI in other areas as well. So. The United States and Europe needs to work together uh, to basically make sure that the future of AI doesn't become China as opposed to uh, Western nations. But the problem is, up until this point, the United States and Europe have had very different approaches to regulating technology, with Europe being much tougher and the United States being more lenient. And so it's harder for us to work together given the very fundamental differences in how we see the role of government and how much regulation there should be. But I do think going forward, that gap is going to start to narrow because I wouldn't say the United States is going to go over to a European model, but we're starting to move closer to that. So like the California privacy law, you know, it's not as tough as the uh, GDPR in uh, Europe, but it's much more moving in that direction than was the case before. Uh, a lot, I think, depends on the upcoming U.S. election, but if by chance we end up with a Democratic president, a Democratic House, and a Democratic Senate, Democrats want to regulate the technology sector, uh, and if they have the political power to do that, the U.S. regulatory regime is going to move in a direction that's much closer to that of Europe, which will make it easier for our uh, the two uh, areas to uh, coordinate. But, but I think it is important that we boost the uh, coordination uh, and kind of uh, build alliances uh, there. So just to drill in on some of the sectoral issues, um, if we think about the transportation sector, which you talked about, um, and uh, we're in the early stages of testing autonomous vehicles, uh, Europe, especially Germany, um, uh, sees the auto industry as a major source of um, economic strength. H how does, how is this transportation, um, how is the merging of AI and transportation tech, the tech industry and the transportation sector, how do you see that shifting, that really important industry um, and what other implications do you see? That is a great example, particularly from the standpoint of Europe, because as you uh, point out, the automotive sector is really important for several European uh, uh, countries, uh, Germany, uh, France, uh, Italy, uh, to some extent. And all of those companies are putting a lot of money into AI and autonomous vehicles, just seeing that as the future of their sector. But what the European Union has to be careful about is Data protection, of course, is very important. Uh, protecting privacy is uh, very important. But the tougher you are in those areas, the harder it is to develop the AI for autonomous vehicles. And let me give you a specific example. Autonomous vehicles require high definition mapping. Like you cannot keep the car in your lane just by using GPS geolocation information. That is not accurate enough. Like GPS can be accurate 
within one to three feet. And for most applications, that's a perfectly reasonable level of accuracy. For transportation, you know, if your car is three feet over, you're in the other person's lane and you are going to have an accident. And so we have to have high definition mapping, which basically means kind of figuring out uh, the roads, uh, the traffic signals, uh, the lane markings, like very detailed information to a high degree of accuracy, and then incorporating of that and then updating it in real time as there's new construction or road conditions change or whatever. And so that's where there is a conflict between developing the AI for autonomous vehicles versus having a really tough approach to data privacy. And so I think uh, the EU has to kind of think about where that balance should be so that they can maintain a competitive automotive sector, because that's obviously very critical to uh, the future economic prosperity of Europe. And, and another, another sector that's quite different that I want to ask about um, was education. And so you talk about AI being deployed in terms of school assignments, student assessment, school safety. Um, and then we've also talked about the importance of improving education and uh, workforce training. And you talk about how AI can be used to empower teachers um, by giving them um, more tools in terms of tailoring. Um, so, so talk a little bit about the, the benefits and the risks of education and what public policy needs to do to mitigate the risks and get the benefits? I mean, I think there are a lot of opportunities for very positive AI applications in the education area in particular. And COVID has revealed both the opportunities, but also some of the problems that have de developed there and, and what we need to address. But on the opportunity side, like AI and online learning tools can help personalize the learning process to the needs of individual students. We know students vary a lot in how quickly they pick up materials, like some people kind of pick it up instantly and can move up uh, to uh, more complicated stuff uh, very quickly. Other people need more repetition, uh, takes longer, and they need a more uh, personal attention. In a typical classroom, it's very hard for a teacher to navigate those types of student differences. But through online platforms, you can tailor the learning process to the needs of that individual student. Students have very different learning styles, very different learning uh, patterns. Technology can tailor uh, uh, the education to uh, that individual student. And so I just think there are tremendous opportunities there. Now, the technology has to get a lot better. COVID has revealed problems in the sense that, you know, most schools have moved to either complete online learning or some hybrid mix of part online and part uh, in a person. And we already know there are a lot of problems. Uh, you know, some students aren't able to access on learning because they're part of the 20% that doesn't have home uh, broadband. So they're outside the technology revolution. Some don't have fast enough broadband to take advantage of video streaming and online uh, resources. There also are some problems just in terms of the basic ways in which uh, schools are using the AI. So uh, we need to work those things out. But those are things that if we can deal with those particular problems, the upside for education is enormous. And it can help bridge the digital divide that we know is a problem in uh, many different countries. It can tailor the education to the needs of the individual students. And can really uh, facilitate the learning the process. It can help to overcome geographic disparities. Like in every country, rural areas, uh, students in rural areas have far less access to a wide range of, of uh, learning tools than uh, people who are in the city. Well, technology can overcome those uh, geographic uh, problems. So, you know, we need to invest in the broadband. We need to improve the technology so it's uh, more effective. But uh, uh, we believe there are lots of positive applications there. And, and so a completely different third sector, um, uh, and here I know our audience will be very interested, defense. Uh, and I know you dug deep into that, um, you and John Allen. Um, this is a sector where we have no choice um, but to invest and make sure that we're um, on par with our adversaries and competitors. Tell us where we should be worried, where we should focus. Is, is our defense 
department and industry doing enough? Um, I think we need to dig in deep on this one. Yeah. Uh, we have a whole chapter in the book on AI and national defense, uh, courtesy of my co-author, uh, John Allen, a retired general who's thought a lot about uh, AI in the military. And he has lots of uh, really good analysis and lots of uh, really good ideas there. The thing we have to worry about with AI and defense is keeping humans in the loop. So for example, today the United States uses drones for military purposes, but we still keep humans in the loop. Like even after the drone has identified a possible target, there has to be a human being in the US military that presses the trigger and says, go, attack, uh, fire uh, the missile at that uh, target. Our adversaries are not necessarily incorporating the same logic. They're not keeping humans in the loop in the same way. There are lots of very scary AI applications in the military, from military drones that don't have humans in the loop, that somehow they're pre-programmed that if you see condition A, B, or C, you fire regardless. And there's no human judgment or human oversight to stop that. And it ranges from kind of that type of situation to the really scary things of nuclear weapons with AI-empowered decision-making, where we almost end up in a Dr. Strangelove situation of, you know, if the AI and the remote sensors spot something, you know, 3,000 miles away, there's an automatic decision to fire. You know, that is completely destabilizing and completely scary in terms of our future. So there is increasing use of AI in national defense by all the major countries around uh, the world. What we argue in the book is in the post-World War II period, the countries of the world, including countries that were competitive and adversarial, got together to work out international treaties and agreements on the rules of war, you know, we had the Geneva Convention, we basically said, this stuff is acceptable in wartime, this other stuff is not acceptable. We had treaties on the use of chemical weapons and basically prohibited the use of chemical weapons. And by and large, you know, that treaty actually held up very well with the exception of Iraq and Syria where uh, it was uh, violated, but most other countries have respected that. Today, we need to start developing international agreements on what the norms and the rules of the road are for AI-based warfare. Because right now, there's no agreement on what's acceptable and what's unacceptable, what can be used, what should be used, what, and what shouldn't uh, be used. We need to start talking to our adversaries, including China and Russia, to work out agreements. Like in the post-World War II period, you know, the United States and the Soviet Union were armed combatants with thousands of nuclear warheads appointed at one another. We still talked to them. We still negotiated agreements. We came up with uh, agreements on uh, what we could do. We need to do the same thing today so that the AI applications in warfare don't get out of hand and don't destabilize the global order. And um, are, do you, are you hopeful that that can happen? And you know, you're an expert in, in governance and government, and we've seen, you know, as you note, we've seen um, increasing skepticism about the role of government, uh, lack of leadership from the U.S., the technology is moving faster than government is. What If you were advising uh, the next president of either party, what would you say to do to bring people to the table and and try to jumpstart that kind of process? I mean, right now we are at a low point in terms of national governance and international governance. Uh, on almost any, any way that you would define good governance, we are doing a terrible job. In the United States, clearly that's a problem, but it's true in many countries. When you look around the world, most countries now are having serious to severe governance uh, challenges. So if you ask me, what is the situation today and what is the basis for optimism? The honest answer is there's no basis for optimism because we're doing a terrible job. The United States is not exercising global leadership. 
uh, Trump has an America first uh, policy. You know, he doesn't consult with our allies. He just is very impulsive in how he's doing things and there's no uh, strategy uh, behind it. Like that has to change. You know, if I were advising the next administration, which I'm not doing by the way of either party, uh, I would tell them like, we need a strategy. We need to uh, build uh, bridges. We need to consult with our allies, but we also need to talk to our adversaries. Like we have done that uh, at many points in the past. Somehow the idea that China and the United States are adversaries and we shouldn't engage with them and we shouldn't talk with them. I just think that is wrong. We need to talk to them and try and persuade them that human values are important and that human rights are important. And if they want to participate in the global economy, uh, there are certain things they shouldn't be doing uh, that they're currently doing. We need to have those uh, conversations. So my hope is that governance will improve. But right now, there's not a lot of basis for optimism on that front. One of the things that you talk about a lot is um, room to use AI in energy, in uh, helping with the climate problem. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly there has been, such as in, in the Paris uh, Accord, work between, with the U.S. and China, um, you know, in, on an area, this area where we, we found some common ground. And I wonder, um, first of all, you know, is that hand-waving or can AI really make a difference in terms of energy and climate? And do you think that's an area where we could find some uh, room to work together? Uh, that should be an area where we should work together, and we have worked together in the past, and the Paris Accords, uh, Accords were a, a great illustration of that. I think there are lots of very positive AI and tech-related applications in the energy area, in the environmental area, and in uh, helping to uh, deal with uh, climate change. I mean, there are all sorts of efforts to move towards a green economy, uh, to have sustainable uh, buildings, uh, to uh, use AI to chart climate change patterns, uh, just so we have the best available data on uh, what actually is happening. Uh, in our book, we talk, we give a number of examples of how uh, AI is being used in uh, each of those areas. And that's an area where uh, technology can be part of the solution. Like I think today, there are so many problems of technology that we're a little fixated on the negative side and we're forgetting the positive use cases where the technology can become part of the solution. There are a lot of cities around the country that are using remote sensors to track uh, air quality. Uh, there are new buildings uh, being uh, constructed where there are built-in tech solutions to, you know, turn the lights off when uh, people are not there to adjust the, the heating or cooling uh, based on the human need and the human occupancy level in a particular rooms. So, like, there are really good applications out there that I think uh, would make a difference. So those are all examples of what we call in our book, AI for the public good, things that really advance the society, uh, that improve the planet, improve sustainability, they're not always the most profitable area. And so this is where government tax incentives can play a role. Government R&D can be helpful. Uh, government subsidies to encourage the applications that will make the country and the world stronger down the road. So this could be sort of a moonshot kind of effort and do a lot to get, our, get us all excited about the potential, the upside potential of AI and actually produce some good. Yes, absolutely. You know, there are many positive uh, applications out there. And I think, you know, that's one of the opportunities the United States is missing uh, right now because, you know, we're having all these debates about the role of government and, you know, there's a, a large part of our uh, U.S. society that doesn't want the government to play a strong role and, you know, they trust the marketplace. Well, the cost of that philosophy is we are not investing in AI for the public good. So what we're getting is more negative applications and, and commercial applications that have negative fallout without having the ability to counterbalance that with AI for the public good that can improve humanity. So we need a much better balance there than we have right now. And, and talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, if you were at OMB, let's say, 
you know, and you were thinking about how to make the government work better, whether it's the Department of Transportation or the Federal Trade Commission or the Federal Aviation Administration, so that they could meet these challenges and both spur on the good, but also work with industry on mitigating the bad. Um, is it a question of hiring different people? Is it a question of having more capacity? What should they do horizontally across agencies versus you know, updating themselves? What, what kind of advice would you give to the, to the next White House about how to update the government to deal with these challenges? Well, we have to be honest, the technology innovation in the US public sector is terrible. Uh, I mean, you have been in that government. I know lots of other people have been in government. Like the gap between how technology has revolutionized the private sector and private organizations versus how it's barely being used in the public sector and in government agencies is mind boggling. Uh, I mean, America has some of the best tech companies, but we're not availing ourselves of the expertise that is out there. So that just has to be a high priority. Uh, so in terms of what we need to do in particular, you know, we need people in government who understand the technology. Uh, we need them to work closely with tech firms so that the tech solutions that are out there and already are widely used uh, by private companies uh, get uh, used in the uh, public sector. Uh, an example, you know, people worry about fraud in government spending. There are lots of really good AI applications uh, in the fraud area uh, that every private company is using now. You know, you develop AI uh, that scans the financial transactions and the monetary movements and looks for outliers. It looks for the unusual patterns and it then targets them for human inspection. So it's a way to kind of focus on, let's say the 5% of the government ex expenditures where there are suspicious behaviors uh, that are taking place, uh, identifying them, and then basically telling humans, pay attention to these uh, cases. Because one of the problems we have in the United States is people are so cynical about government. They think government is uh, bloated, uh, inefficient, uh, wasteful of uh, spending. Technology can help us make the government more efficient. We also need to be using technology to improve agency operations. Uh, in the private sector, for example, I, I'm, I'm not sure you've had this experience. Like, you know, when we used to fly, when I would fly, like United would then send me a survey asking me to rate the flight. Was I happy with it? Was it on time, et cetera, et cetera. When I would stay in a hotel, like Marriott would send me a survey asking me to rate my experience and provide feedback. When I've gone to Bank of America for a financial uh, transaction, I immediately get a survey naming, giving me the name of the person that I just dealt with and asking me to rate that individual. Uh, you know, was he helpful? Did he uh, handle the transaction, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the private sector is using technology to improve worker performance and improve employee accountability. I believe that these are tools that can be used in the public sector because in many government agencies, you have the entry level people who are doing the work, the mid level people who are supervising the entry level people just to make sure they're doing their job. And then the higher level appointments who are charting the vision, the strategy and the long term direction. Technology can help us flatten those organizations and make them more efficient. You're not necessarily going to need all those mid-level supervisors just to make sure the entry-level people are doing their job because these productivity tools will allow us to determine whether they are doing their job. Because if they're not doing their job and they're online surveys that uh, create some accountability, we're going to know that uh, almost uh, instantly. Uh, and so technology definitely can be part of the solution. It can improve uh, government uh, performance. Like in order for Americans to become less cynical about government, there has to be better performance and technology is going to be part of the answer of how the government performs better. So one of the things that you bring up and that most people bring up in their fears about AI and their cynicism is the bias, the potential for discrimination. 
um, the potential for it to be used uh, um, against the most vulnerable, whether at the border or in the criminal justice system. Are there, are there hardline prohibitions you would set against using AI in, in certain areas? Um, and, you know, a bunch of localities have, um, have put bans in facial recognition, for instance. Um, and uh, similarly, so that's one part, maybe hardline bans in some areas. In the discrimination area, we don't allow, you know, we, we, we carefully uh, control data use in employment and credit monitoring and healthcare and so on, because those are such sensitive areas. We want to think about how data is used there and, and discrimination, um, what kind of discrimination there is there. So how would you think about this, protecting the most vulnerable from um, discriminatory decision-making, opaque decision-making, or, um, uh, or surveillance or control that we don't want to see? I think both of those areas are where some of the most highly problematic AI applications are taking place. The criminal justice system and law enforcement and a kind of employment uh, application. So well, let me uh, address uh, each of those situations. So the problem in the criminal justice system is there has been this new trend called predictive analytics in yeah. which communities, uh, cities are looking at data on who's committed crimes and then using that to predict who is likely to commit a crime in the future or what neighborhoods is there likely to be a big a crime problem. And then using that information to uh, uh, allocate resources to deploy uh, police and, uh, uh, and, uh, and do other things. The problem is in the United States, our criminal justice system has so much racism and discrimination in terms of past practices that if you're using past data to project future behavior, you're essentially projecting bad decisions uh, into the future and then acting on them. And so it creates a, a, a very bad mechanism to make decisions and allocate uh, resources. And it just per perpetuates uh, the known bias problems uh, that we have in that area. So uh, we think communities should be extremely careful about using these predictive analytic uh, tools. Uh, most of them uh, are have serious uh, built-in uh, uh, biases and uh, are uh, highly problematic. The employment area is also an area that we're monitoring pretty carefully because we're starting to see more AI applications uh, in those areas as well, particularly in terms of hiring decisions because, you know, uh, especially during a recession, you advertise a job and you get hundreds of applications and, you know, it's takes a lot of time to kind of sort through them one by one. So companies are starting to use AI to screen resumes. Now, if it's just looking at the formal qualifications of the job, like, you know, if you're required to have a college education in order to qualify for a particular position, the AI can scan all the applications and see, you know, do you have a college education and weed out those who do not. That's, that's okay. But we're also starting to see a more dangerous use of AI trying to screen for the informal qualities that people look for in jobs. Like, you know, is the person persistent? Are they resilient? Are they competent? Are they effective? Do they have some basic uh, sense of integrity in terms of uh, doing the job? There are companies that are advertising AI solutions to monitor for those types of things. And the AI is not that good. The AI is not accurate. That's an example of an AI application that should be strongly discouraged, if not prohibited, because it, it's just not accurate and it's not effective at performing this task. So I think you're exactly right that uh, there are certain applications where there are just built-in biases given the nature of past practices and unrepresentative data that we have, and we need to be very careful about uh, deploying AI in those particular areas because they do have such important consequences for human beings. This is such a fascinating subject, and I'm so glad you wrote this book. And I feel like it covers everything. You know, I mean, I feel like this is, you know, the future of governance. It's the future of the economy. It's the future of 
um, civil rights, and uh, and you've you've somehow managed to make this incredibly readable book uh, that that um, doesn't make us anxious confronting these big questions and really holds our hand through it. And uh, you've done a real service there. And so um, I really appreciate your taking the time to talk to us. Did you have any final wrap up thoughts that you wanted to leave the audience with? Uh, this has been so magisterial. I don't know if you have anything left to say, but I want to give you the last word. Yeah, I'll just close with one uh, quick comment and, and uh, want to thank you for uh, providing the uh, forum and appreciate all the uh, terrific uh, questions as well. I think in the end, John Allen and I are optimistic about AI in the sense that we argue in the book, humans are still in control. I mean, there clearly are big problems in terms of bias, fairness, uh, transparency, and human safety, but there are ways to deal with all of those problems. In the same way that when you look at the history of new technologies, there always have been problems of any new technology, and eventually we figure out how to uh, deal with them. We have the ability to do that right now. It's just a matter of thinking about the policies, the laws, and the uh, regulations. So uh, I think for people who are concerned about uh, technology, they will find a book that's pretty honest about assessing the problems of the technology, but also in trying to propose solutions for dealing with those issues. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Karen, appreciate it.